I'm occasionally asked questions about how I make bikeumentaries. The most common questions are what camera I use, how the heck I manage to get smooth video when riding a bike over tree stumps, and what software I use. As it's the depths of winter and not really a good time of year to be filming, I thought now would be a good time to throw together a quick run through of the kit I use. First off, the bike. This is a cheap second hand mountain bike. I got this one for 90 quid. The previous owner bought it new to exercise during lockdown and took it round the block twice, then decided to sell it. There's nothing special about it apart from me adding a couple of mounts, one for a phone and a GoPro mount I sometimes use for the action cam. The camera is a DJI Osmo Action, old model. There are many action cams on the market, but I picked this one because of price, features and overall bang for buck. It records in various resolutions up to 4K using various codecs and records in speeds from 240 frames per second, which gives 8 times slow motion, right down to a time lapse function. I can't find the original of this shot. This is downloaded from Facebook, hence the cruddy quality. The microphone is just a cheap clip on with a very cheap furry windshield for outside use. They're often called cat fur windshields, and one manufacturer actually uses the name Dead Cat for their product. How to keep the camera image stable whilst bouncing over rough terrain is a big question. You can stabilise a bouncing image to some extent with software on a camera and then on a computer, but not having a bouncing image to start with is by far the best option. Some action cams have digital image stabilisation, including mine, but I don't really know how good it is because I use this fella, a gimbal. It's an electronic mount that detects movement and uses motors to react in three planes to mechanically stabilise the camera. You can see that whatever way I twist and turn it, the camera remains pointing in the direction it's told. You can mount the action cam anywhere you need to, and I've tried mounting the camera on the handlebars and on the top of the helmet, but I found the best results are from a chest mount with an extension bar to keep it high enough to get the handlebars in shot just occasionally. You can see by the handlebars how much the bike is bouncing around, yet the camera is stabilised. You can bounce over potholes and tree roots and still get good footage from it. You can buy a range of gimbals from cheap ones to use with a mobile phone, right up to professional rigs. This one's a Feutech and cost about £120. I chose this one mainly on good reviews on YouTube. My drone is a DJI Mavic 2 Zoom. I call her Mavis, and the name Mavis Films comes from this. I'm not very imaginative with names, but last drone was a DJI Spark, and he got called Sparky. Mavis is an impressive bit of kit. Her position in flight or hovering is maintained by GPS and onboard positioning cameras. Even in strong winds, she can safely hold position. She's also got anti-collision sensors all round. These stop her in her tracks when an obstacle is detected, but spindly things such as trees without leaves are best avoided. The camera is stabilised by a three-axis gimbal like the one I wear for the action cam, and it works extremely well. When it's windy, you see her pitching and bucking to maintain position, but thanks to the gimbal, all you see on the screen is a rock-solid picture. There are quite a few pre-programmed shots, so you don't even need to fly her yourself. Just choose one of the program modes, line yourself up and click follow me, and that's exactly what happens. By combining the orbit mode with the tracking and moving object mode, you get this shot. Flying around a moving cyclist, me. Another party trick is to rotate around a tower whilst rising upwards. This flight was pre-programmed on the PC at home with Google Earth and downloaded to Mavis. Just in case the self-appointed drone police are about to get leery, all people in the shot are involved persons and I had my two adult kids acting as marshals for this shot. Another feature is time lapse, both moving and stationary. The technical term for when she's moving during a time lapse is a hyperlapse. I didn't overfly the bridge just in case you were wondering, I zoomed in for the effect. I try to do filming from the drone and action cam on different days if possible. My brain can't cope with too much misbehaving tech at one time. I like to do the odd bit of talking to camera as I think it makes a good intro to the film. I can't cope with remembering anything, so I use an auto cue. I've just embedded it in this gizmo that reflects a moving script from a tablet or a phone in a special mirror, but things haven't always been so high tech. 
how I've done the talking to camera bit in the past is to have an auto cue app running on a tablet. Usually it's slung under the camera with a bit of string, but sometimes it's perched precariously on a park bench. You can see the setup here. The mini tripod has the action cam on it, with the tablet running the app resting against it. While I'm out filming, I carry a small tripod, a stills camera, spare drone propellers, battery pack, spare batteries, charging leads and so on. I'm pretty forgetful these days, I have a checklist to follow, but even so, still manage to leave the house without charging stuff, making sure memory cards aren't full, and generally forgetting important things such as charging leads. Must be an age thing. It all fits neatly in this tatty old rucksack that probably dates from when my kids were in high school. I use it partly because it's very comfortable to wear whilst riding, and partly for security. Nothing screams steal me louder than an expensive shiny box with a brand name on it. I'm hoping that if burglars see this, they're probably thinking stinky sportswear and avoid it like the plague. Part two, what happens once the film is in the can? We had fun filming part one because our cat wanted to express her opinions a lot. Have a look at the bloopers bit at the end. We won't see her in part two because she doesn't come upstairs much. However, we do have Alexa up here. Hopefully she'll keep quiet. Alexa, stop. Anyway. Welcome to my desk. I'm not going to call it my studio or anything equally pretentious because it is what it is. A messy desk with an average PC shoved underneath. Not even a gaming one with a good graphics card. First off, I've been asked what software I use for editing. It's a bit of a mix really. I use Audacity for voiceovers, Photoshop for stills and some of the maps, Adobe After Effects for some of the graphics, and Adobe Premiere Pro to stick everything together. One advantage of it is that there are endless tutorials on YouTube for old duffers like me, as none of it's instinctive. You've probably noticed the three monitors and wondering if they're all necessary. Probably not, but it does make working with Premiere Pro a lot easier. You can use one screen, but you keep having to open and close bits of the program, or have it all cluttered up together, which makes it a right pain to work with. I was going to say pain in the ass. Plus, you do need a full screen preview, and switching in and out of it is annoying to say the least. First world problem or what? Having it all open makes life easier. I'd love a Samsung ultra wide 49 inch curved monitor, but they run out at about 1200 quid. My PC is far too feeble to drive it, so my solution is a couple of cheap upcycled monitors from Facebook Marketplace. My first monitor has the assembly timeline, effects for the clip being worked on, audio level indicator and a time indicator. My second monitor is a full screen preview. And number three has all the clips I'm using in the current project and the audio and video effects bin. I've got a couple of setups for different tasks. For example, color grading where I try and get all the clips to match for brightness, contrast and color. I like the soundtrack to be a mix of commentary and natural sounds. Getting the mix right has taken me a while. I find voiceovers for the commentary work well, but they aren't simple to do, especially for someone who's not a natural voiceover artist. It's not a skill us electricians are trained for. Although Premiere Pro has audio editing, it's bloody complicated for what it does, and Audacity is a much simpler solution. When I'm recording, I have to kneel on the floor to speak into the mic, because my chair squeaks quite badly, and you can hear it on the soundtrack. I use Monitor 1 for the script, and monitor too for what's happening with the recording. It's then very easy to cut out all of the inevitable er, uh, ah, uh, ums, and all of the pauses and heavy breathing. The other thing it's great for is cutting out swearing, which comes in very useful. My biggest challenge with editing has been working out how to do a natural commentary and have appropriate background sounds. I've tried ad-libbing while riding, but that was hopeless. I've tried dictating the text to my phone and playing it back in an earpiece whilst riding. That sort of worked, but not well. I've even tried putting an auto cue on the phone and mounting it on the handlebars, but I can't concentrate on not crashing the bike and reading the auto cue. I know that me falling off and crashing is why some of you guys watch these, but whilst I'm out riding, my main concern is not flattening innocent bystanders. So I'm not going to try and read an auto cue or try to do a script whilst riding. I do make the odd comment or have occasional chats to people whilst out, but most of the commentary will be done at home. What works best for me is to ride around without talking, 
just recording background sounds. I then put the voiceover recorded on the PC on top and adjust the levels for best result. Once I've finished editing, I just leave the computer alone, often for some hours for it to produce a final render. Then I upload it to YouTube and hope somebody watches it. Clearly, it takes a lot of time and effort to make these films, so why do I do it? It's a combination of several things, really. Firstly, I love riding my bike. It's great exercise and there are a lot of places to cycle off-road. By that, I don't mean bumping over tree roots and gravel constantly, although that is fun. I mean routes you can cycle without cars. Secondly, I have an interest in local history, something I've come to appreciate much more as I've got older. Thirdly, somewhere inside me is a filmmaker trying to escape. I've always been interested in photography and had an old Super 8 cine camera back in the day. And lastly, I don't watch a great deal of TV. I prefer faffing around on the computer. So combining my interests of cycling, local history and adding gadgets into the mix equals bikeumentaries. I forgot, planning. I have been asked about how much I plan. Truth is, not much. I plan the ride and have a rough idea of what I'm trying to achieve. But once the ride is in the can, detailed research starts. Once you see your ideas on the screen, then changes happen. Some ideas don't work, so they get binned or reworked. Some ideas work brilliantly, so I build on them. And sometimes new discoveries spin me off into entirely new directions altogether. Shows you how good my planning is when I forgot to include planning in the FAQ at the start of the film. Well, in a nutshell, that's it. The recipe for flinging together a bikeumentary. I hope this answers some of the questions I've been asked and that people find it moderately interesting. I'm looking at films to make in 2022. So far, I'm working on the old railway line from Westmoors to Salisbury. Yes, there was one, but very little evidence remains it was ever there. I'm also working on covering the Bourne stream from source to sea. I've sort of covered this before, but the history of the Talbot sisters' philanthropy is well worth talking about. Plus, it's an excuse to use some nighttime drone footage of Bournemouth seafront. The other definite plan is to do the Bath to Bristol Trail, starting on the Kennet and Avon towpath of Bath and finishing on the disused railway going into Bristol. I have a feeling there's lots of history to discover, plus it's an excuse to do some droning around the Clifton Suspension Bridge. So keep, keep, I think we're going a bit fast. Oh, I think I'll show that one to Alice. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> the bike now runs on the newest phone. Maybe I need three phones. They're often called cat fur windshields, and one manufacturer actually uses the name Dead Cat Belch. <laughs> That's a good climax to that cocktail. What a belch. Oh. Oh, shut up. One advantage with chest mounting is that the body. The body. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does. Once you see your ideas on the screen, then changes happen. Some ideas don't. She's literally over here looking directly at the camera and she did that. And sometimes new discoveries spin me off into entirely new directions altogether. Have you finished? No! You're really encouraging her now. Shut up! Here we go. I forgot. You couldn't make it up, could you? Shut up! Noise. I got my bit right, just you.
Thanks for watching and please hit the subscribe button to keep updated.